More than 800 million people around the world are affected by extreme poverty and hunger. In sub-Saharan Africa, almost a quarter of the population is undernourished, in spite of government development aid coming from industrialized countries. Private businesses are now getting more and more involved in the fight against poverty. Responsibility has been shifted from the public sphere into the hands of corporations and the market. The corporations are the new uh, saints, the new paladins of development and food security. You know, we just blow the whistle and they will come in and, uh, and save us all. More and more major Western banks and businesses are getting involved in development aid, and they're doing so with government support. In 2015, member states at the UN General Assembly resolved to eliminate extreme poverty and hunger worldwide by 2030 with the help of the private sector. But does this new model of development aid work? Will it really benefit the needy, or does it just serve corporate interests? We take a look at several examples in East Africa, in Kenya, Zambia, and Tanzania. We're about to visit a business in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, that receives support from France's state development aid agency, AFD. Its subsidiary, Proparco, and other European development banks backed a fund worth 45 million euros. It, in turn, invested 2 million euros in the Nairobi-based business, European Foods Africa. Development banks such as Proparco were originally set up to fight hunger and poverty, but in this case, state development funds mix with private capital and are being invested with a focus on financial returns. The Kenyan company, European Foods Africa, sells ready-made pizzas made by the German firm Dr. Oetke and imported from Germany. The business bought modern cold storage rooms with the money from the fund. The company owner is a German who lives in Nairobi. Six years ago, Stefan Belzer had the idea of selling frozen pizzas from Germany in Kenya. They normally arrive here in a container. Each container holds roughly 12,000 pizzas. We store several different types here and deliver them to supermarkets and grocers. And to expand the company, we now have to find more locations so we can supply more. The investor expects Stefan Belzer to expand, but isn't it a ludicrous idea to support the marketing of frozen fast food with development aid money? More and more consumers in Nairobi are switching to ready meals, but only affluent customers can afford a Dr. Oetker pizza. Frozen pizza is definitely very expensive here compared to Germany. A pizza here costs around €7.80. In Germany, I think they retail for €2.50 euros to €3. Euros. The €2 million euros in development aid money isn't supporting local production, but the import of European goods. The goal of the Fanisi company, our investment group, is for us to attract the attention of other international companies who might like to sell their frozen products through us and use our warehouses and distribution chains. 
This is not local development aid. It doesn't support the economy in the individual country. It supports businesses in Germany or in Europe. It's aid for foreign trade. I think development aid money is there to fight poverty, strengthen state structures and support healthcare and education. But the reality is that more and more it's supporting foreign trade. European development banks invest in private companies to improve living conditions, especially in remote rural areas. For example, in Zambia, one of the world's poorest countries, people here have an average life expectancy of just 52. In the northeast of the country, a huge oil palm plantation has been set up. It measures 20,000 hectares in total and also features a mill to obtain oil from the fruits. The operation is run by Zambia's biggest agricultural and food processing company, Zambief. €35 million Euros were loaned to Zambief by several development banks in Europe, including the German Investment and Development Corporation, DEG, a subsidiary of the KFW Development Bank. Zambief used some of the money to found a subsidiary, Zampalm. Zampam is a project um, which deals in um, palm trees to produce palm oil as cooking oil at the moment. Uh, Zampam started in uh, late 2008. Uh, we had our first nursery in December 2008, uh, of which those are some of the plants that we, we, we tried to plant in 2009. The plantation started off with major problems. A consultant had recommended the wrong type of palm tree. Then it became clear that the soil was too moist for oil palms. The company had the water table lowered by 1.2 metres. The high expenditures for all this preparatory work were made possible by the loan from DEG. Why would DEG invest in such a dubious project? DEG has been investing in Zambief for years. Zambief is an important business in Zambia's agricultural sector. It contributes to food security and food supplies in the country. And it generates employment in a marginal region and gives the people there an opportunity to work. Zambief employs 600 workers on the oil palm plantation during the harvest, but only 140 of them are employed year-round. Everyone else is a seasonal worker. Critics say that for investment sums of such magnitudes, the gains in development should be significantly higher. When you ask DEG about such projects, they always say, it's a great example of good development aid. They never address the criticism, they just brush it off. Many questions have been posed to the German parliament about DEG's role. 27 organisations submitted a petition calling for DEG to be required to publish information about its involvements and loans. The basic problem with DEG is that it's a black box. We don't know what it gets up to because it doesn't publish. It's not accountable. We only find out about DEG activities through NGOs or journalists who do research on site or through concerned citizens who go public. That's how we find out that something's gone wrong with DEG projects. Since the 1st of January 2015, DEG has published its investments and the names of its clients on its website. You can find a lot of information there about our investments. But Zampalm doesn't show up on the DEG website. Research by the anti-hunger NGO FIAN showed that 10 million euros flowed into the project. The DEG only confirmed that after queries but it's still unclear what environmental and social standards Zampalm adheres to. The loan is also ecologically controversial. 430,000 oil palms were planted in the swampy area, as the farm manager proudly reports. 
If you look at all these fields, nothing, we did not stamp any train here. It, it was just a plain. And then um, at the moment, I think we, we have put trees. Um, if you multiply 3,000 hectares by 143, just on average, it's quite a number of trees that we put around where there were no trees. Every year in December, more trees are planted. The idea being to continue until all 20,000 hectares are full. Draining the marshland releases large amounts of carbon dioxide, which negatively impacts the climate. But the plantation isn't just ecologically questionable. Huge palm oil plantations are sponsored with loans from DEG. There are charges that people have been driven off the land, that promises haven't been kept, such as building schools and clinics. Before the plantation was created, there were 45 families living around the lake. Zampalm resettled them. That's the official term. At first, the three village elders were reluctant to talk about it on camera. We sat down with the village chief when Zampalm came to discuss whether we would agree to have them here. We agreed in the hope that our situation would improve as a result. Chief Copper, who officially distributes the land, was given a tractor. But the population is still waiting for the business to make good on its promises. The clinic Zampam promised eight years ago, the police station, the school. After some hesitation, the village elders express their dissatisfaction. The new school was never built. We only have the old state school here. You can see it over there. None of the things Sampalm promised have been built. Not the school, not the clinic, not the police station. The plantation manager confirms the plans for a clinic and a school, but he won't talk about it on camera. Zambief's management also refuses to grant us an interview. The company says it will answer in writing once it has all the facts, but that still hasn't happened. What does the lender, DEG, have to say? As far as we know, no promises were made. The question always is, to what extent should a company that pays taxes to the state also invest additionally in this social infrastructure? We want to see progress before we die, especially us three. Especially we three. <laughs> we want to see that our children are getting ahead. That we've left something good for them. Companies aren't required to build clinics and schools, but in regions with poor infrastructure, that's what they often promise so as to gain access to land. Zampalm isn't the only farm run by Zambief. In the northwest of the country, the company has another large farm on 10,000 hectares. The village of Mimbolo is close by. A land conflict has been smouldering here for more than a decade. 50 families were forced out by the predecessor company. The villagers fought back. During their protest march, the fence of the plantation was destroyed. Francis Commander and a neighbour were arrested and spent 10 days in police custody. Initially, they were to be sentenced to five years in prison, but the Zambian president intervened and they were released. However, they had to pay a fine of 7,000 euros for the broken fence. They were suffered. I was with the kids at home. We will finish to give them for the food for the child to eat, nothing. So I'm staying here for hungry. Well, we need to go back to the land there because we have nowhere to farm. So if the land is given back to us, we are due to go back there. 
There was a situation in the past where the local population claimed it had access to this land and was allowed to use it. And since in this case it was government land, it was legal for Zambief to get this farm and this concession. The village community took the case to the High Court in 2004, which decided in its favour. But the company appealed and won. According to the constitution, the small farmers are entitled to the land they're farming, but the government sold it anyway. The families are facing ruin. Some couldn't cope with the years of waiting for a decision. The elders lament that 11 villagers have committed suicide since that time. Altogether, we were 52, but we, uh, 11 perished. When the situation tatsächlich so is, that these. If it's really true that 11 people committed suicide, then that's really sad. But there's enough land in the region and plenty of development opportunities for the land, so that these small farmers have other options. They don't have to lay claim to land where the Supreme Court decided that it's for the company to use. The villagers of Mimbolo can't just go and use other land. The fertile land is taken up by the plantation and the other surrounding areas are forested. It would take a lot of work and money to clear them. Development aid, intended to combat hunger and poverty, has worsened the situation here. The villagers are pinning their hope in the district administration. We are still negotiating with the farms. We want them to give up at least part of the land which they do not use so that local people can also use that land to grow their crops. Now, if we chase away those people, where are they going to go? Yeah. So we just have to have a win-win situation where all benefit. The assumption there, and I'm sure you've heard this term, is that public-private partnerships are a win-win-win affair because uh, everybody gets something out of it. There's you know, money and, of course, a bit of profits, but at the same time you get efficiency and you get uh, services and, you know, everybody wins. But, in fact, there is no evidence of this. On balance, the residents of Mimbolo are the losers with this investment. And in other places, too, European development banks are issuing loans to those who already have money, strengthening the already strong. Now there's an investment fund that wants to combat hunger and poverty. The Africa Agriculture and Trade Investment Fund, ARTIF for short. The German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development invested the biggest share, 45 million euros of taxpayers' money, along with 20 million from the KFW Development Bank and 20 million from Deutsche Bank. The fund's worth climbed to 125 million euros. It invested around 9 million euros in the company Chobi Agrovision in Zambia. One of its farms is located in central Zambia and is one of the biggest in the country. The fund prospectus advertises that Artif raises local incomes and therefore food security. The money was used to set up a large soy plantation. But here too, the land was not empty. Some farmers were relocated. The majority of the land was forest. It has been cut down. On my right-hand side behind you, you can see some of the natural, natural bush forest that it was. So these particular fields were cleared from that bush. Um, and to do that, to clear it and make it just ready to, to accept planting, you're probably talking $3,000 a hectare. In addition to the cost of clearing, there were additional expenses of 5,300 euros per hectare for irrigation facilities, pipes, electricity cables and roads. The business was able to expand the amount of agricultural land that could be irrigated by a factor of seven. 
Two harvests per year are possible here in Zambia, but that can only be realised if the water from the rainy season is captured so it can be used to irrigate the fields in the dry season. That's why the company has built a large reservoir and a pump station. But what about the benefit for the local population? How many jobs were created with the €9 million Euro investment? We run the estate with, with a workforce of 147. So, and that's all inclusive. So in the fields as such, we probably, you know, we've only got a workforce of 54 who work on the 2,800 hectares. So we're very mechanized um, in relationship to, to maybe some other crops like tobacco or something like that. We're very, we're very mechanized, low labor input. Um, so I would say that the portion of labor to the costs is, is negligible. As, for, as in compared to the cost of herbicide and the cost of fertiliser and the cost of watering. Thomas Dover of the Investment Fund's Board of Directors is pleased with the success. Man muss sagen, diese 100, uh, These 130 or 140 jobs are really secure. It's a stable business. The people are earning money and they're stimulating the local economy as a result. The soy farm as a jobs engine. It's not really a convincing argument. When the farm was set up, the goal was to create 1,600 jobs. Chorbi Agrovision is far from that. The German lenders believe they're raising the incomes of the local population with their investments, thereby fighting malnourishment and poverty. The Artif Fund claims to be popular with religious institutions, orders and pension funds. They want to invest their pastors' pensions in profitable ways, but the fund won't reveal the investing institutions, citing banking secrecy instead. Most other investors are not made public, and the fund's location also raises questions. The fund is based in Luxembourg. The German government said that quite openly in response to a question from me. There's no tax on profits there. In times when we're discussing the Panama Papers, that's very interesting. You go there because you don't want to pay tax. Luxembourg is well known as a tax haven, but the German development minister doesn't see a problem. There are no middlemen structures and money doesn't get lost. I owe that to the German taxpayer. But the ATIF fund is registered in Luxembourg. I'll take a look at what kind of model it is and we'll see if anything needs changing. The minister evidently doesn't know the ATIF investment fund, even though his ministry put 45 million euros of taxpayers' money into it under his predecessor, Dirk Niebel. And another tax haven is involved. Chorby Agrovision is now part of a company whose official headquarters are in Mauritius, an island in the Indian Ocean known for its lax tax laws. The first thing you should look at with every investment you make is that the company pays tax locally. If it's based in Mauritius, that won't be the case because it's a tax haven. That business is trying to avoid paying tax. I can't answer questions about corporate tax, whether it's due in Zambia or Mauritius, in any detail. If only a small amount of tax remains in the country, Zambia will continue to be unable to pay for public services. One particular imbalance is created by the risk distribution of the ARTIF fund. Taxpayers alone bear the losses. If the fund makes a profit, then the private investors collect. Profits are privatised, losses are socialised. That's the ARTIF principle. The German state is used here as a risk buffer for a company that wants to become the largest soy maize and wheat supplier in southern Africa. Deutsche Bank also benefits from this. We know what we're doing. ATIF is a step ahead because it's been around for five years now, and it can demonstrate a solid investment portfolio. Since we have the first loan repayments this year, we'll have new means to make new investments. 
It shows investors that this kind of partnership can work. We, taxpayers, are paying up front so that the corporations can start making a profit right away and don't have to wait. And I find this absolutely unacceptable. The public-private partnership model obscures the fact that the interests of businesses and small farmers are by no means the same. Is development aid really there to support the biggest businesses in the market? Agricultural companies that fence off huge areas, infringing on local people's land use and rights of way? Chobi Agrovision has done just that on another farm in western Zambia, triggering a conflict with the local population. So there are people who live this side. Now this company wants to fence off this area. So these people will not have access to this water here. So that's where the conflict is. It's not just access to water that's a problem. Access to the nearest clinic is too. It's obstructed by a fence. A few months ago, a girl was bitten by a snake. Two villagers wanted to take her to the clinic in Somawe farm, but they weren't allowed in. We're locked out here at the fence, so we went to the gate over there, but the guard wouldn't let us in. He said, no, it's late, and the clinic is closed. I was sure that that wasn't the case because it was an emergency. The guard remained firm. The men had to walk to a clinic further away. It took them an hour and a half to walk there. It was too long. When they arrived, the girl was dying. Tomawe Farm belongs to Chobi Agrovision, the company that works with the Artif Investment Fund. Legally, the company isn't required to let anyone on its property. But don't the investors have a moral responsibility? I don't know about any death. And it's important to understand that the Somawe farm wasn't funded by Artif. Our money didn't go there. It's also my understanding that this fence was needed to demarcate the property because there had been too much trespassing on the private land. That would have harmed the agricultural production. The villagers say they feel treated like slaves. They're suffering under the situation. The girl left us just because of this fence. If they at least gave us a small gate, then we could get to the clinic faster. Instead, we have to walk around the fence and take the long route to the other clinic. That has severe consequences for us and so we lost one of our own. This case shows that such public-private development projects can in fact make things worse for the poorest of the poor. We know that Davos we know that places that don't have clinics or schools or roads that are built by the state and therefore accessible to all will not see development. The state is withdrawing more and more from its responsibility. Increasingly, it's private investors that are taking over the roles of the public sector. Zambia, for example, invites foreign companies to invest in the areas of health, infrastructure and energy, as well as agriculture. The Zambian Development Agency banks on public-private partnerships. Government doesn't just offer land to big agricultural companies, it also gives the investors additional tax relief. Henry Sakala runs the Zambian Public-Private Partnership Unit. What the basically get as incentives is um, uh, to import plant and machinery duty-free. Now, um, obvious businessmen, that's a bigger cash flow uh, saving from that point of view. If you can import something without tax, tax uh, and put up a factory and you've got five years to do uh, that, that type of importation, 
and also you can enjoy uh, tax-free dividends. Uh, you can repatriate your profits after you have paid all the obligations. I think uh, that one is a, is a positive for, for an investor to, to come down here. The companies remain tax-free for five years after they've made their first profits. Zambia competes for investors with many other countries, but these partnerships between African states and global corporations are unequal. The beneficiary governments are the only ones who really have to spell out in detail the policy changes that they will make, and which of course are suggested to them strongly by the corporations and the, the donors, in order to create an enabling environment for private sector investment. There are smaller businesses that also want to invest in African countries. Another project called Develop demonstrates that. The three Ps stand for Public-Private Partnership. The German government's programme supports medium-sized companies that want to do business with developing countries. The German company Ecoland Herbs received €100,000, for example. It's one of 1,500 companies that have been supported with relatively small sums. Managing director Rudolf Buhler is visiting Zanzibar where a spice farmer is showing him his plantation. He grows fruit and vegetables for his own use on one hectare. He also grows nutmeg, pepper, cinnamon and lemongrass. Yes. And so this is very aromatic, yeah. Rudolf Buhler works with 25 spice farmers in Zanzibar. Ridiwan Ali is one of them. He shows us how cinnamon is obtained from the bark of a tree. It grows back after harvest. This is cinnamon without the outer layer of bark. That's extremely important because the bark contains bitter substances. When we export this to Germany, the quality has to be good, that is, without this grey exterior layer. It can be used for cinnamon chips, and at the end, it's ground down into cinnamon powder. Rudolf Buhler markets the spices and processes them in the sausages that he makes with a producer group in Germany. He can only sell the organic spices in Germany if they're certified. He uses DEG support to train the farmers in Zanzibar so they can get the organic certification themselves. A consultant travels to Zanzibar three times a year. He brings the spice farmers microorganisms that provide the foundation for a special natural fertilizer. We don't use fertilizers and pesticides in organic farming. But we can't just do nothing. We have to strengthen the plants. We have to stimulate nature in the spirit of homeopathy. That gives us healthier crops. There's a big demand for Demeter products. It's an additional opportunity for our farmers here to produce the best possible spices and to obtain a proper price for them. The spice farmers have always worked without artificial fertilizers and pesticides, but these biodynamic compost substances are new to them. The advantage is they don't have to invest any capital. It's a big difference for me. I wasn't familiar with some of the fertilizers, but now my new colleagues have told me about them. That's real progress. Organic farming is better and more sustainable than other production methods that also require expensive fertilizers. Organic farming only requires what's already available on the plantation.
The farmer is climbing the tree to harvest nutmeg. It's important that they don't fall to the ground where they will rot. Before the partnership with Rudolf Buhler, the farmers mainly sold their spices to tourists. That's changed because Buhler agrees a guaranteed price with them in advance. Before I joined this project, my harvest and my earnings were very low. But now I earn twice as much and can lead a much better life. Rudolf Buhler wants the farmers to dry the spices so they can be exported. Quality standards are important for storage and sale. The spice farmers are bringing in their pepper today so its moisture content can be measured. This batch isn't as dry as it should be. I can turn a blind eye, but it should be under 12. The farmers get a good price for the pepper if it's dry enough, nine euros per kilogram. The farmer is delivering more than 100 kilograms today for which he earns 950 euros. Our children so to, to go to school, about the money we, then we pay on the school. Then. So we get more money when we sell the, our product. Yeah, so we're happy. Only the people who have a good income can send their children to school here. But in a society where 30% are illiterate, even that is enormous progress. The German company is able to pay them a better price because half of the funding for their project comes from the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Unlike other projects, the principle here is that the farmers remain independent and get to determine for themselves what they grow, where and how. Uh, the farmer of Zanzibar organic grower, yes. we think here. Yes. For generation. Exactly. We think in generations, yes. And, and not profit, profit. We think, you know, to develop nicely. Yes. Nevertheless, Rudolf Buhler hasn't come to Zanzibar as a benefactor. He's here as a businessman. The DEVELOP program only supports German and European businesses with annual turnovers of at least a million euros and with at least 10 employees. This model only works in agriculture if the farmers produce for export. The spice farmers on Zanzibar are therefore the exception. The vast majority of agricultural businesses produce for the domestic market and don't benefit from such projects. Why not start from the fact that it is indeed the small-scale producers who are the main actors and see what they need to do a better job of what they're already doing? So an alternative is we have a good examples. When you go to Dodoma, Dodoma actually is a central region in Tanzania, we have organized people who were organized, these small-scale farmers who were organized by our our NGO, Mviwata, they built their own market. Now people, when harvest, go to sell their own produce at this market. They arrange, they decide for the prices. When you go to this center known as Kibaigua, these small scale farmers are now rich. Small-scale farmers need access to land, water and to markets. Then they can even supply cities with a population of more than a million. In Africa, that's still the reality. 70% of food for the continent's megacities comes from the surrounding areas. But at the moment, small farmers can barely live off their earnings. If they organise, they can negotiate better prices. With a bit of support, they can set up warehouses for potatoes, rice and maize. 
That way, they're not forced to sell their produce right after the harvest to the first buyer who comes along. All of this helps them improve their income and feed their families. Better than big investments in huge farms. It's the corporations and the big trading countries who dominate the food system and hence have the power. And they have the power because they're the ones who establish the rules, they're the ones who also do the, uh, the regulation. The deck is really stacked in favor of the corporations and against the small-scale producers who are actually the ones who feed the world. Small-scale farmers feed three-quarters of the people on the planet, yet two-thirds of those who go hungry are small and landless farmers. Hunger usually strikes at the end of the season when the old harvest is used up and the new crops are not yet in sight. Solutions to remedy this, such as the establishment of collectives, were neglected in years gone by, not least by state development aid. <laughs> These uh, European Union banks and the other multinational organizations, if they want really to solve the problems of poverty in developing countries, they need to consult these groups of poor. They need to come to the poor themselves because they are organized and they are known illegally. Put the money there. Putting small farmers at the center, that should be the main task if we are to get closer to the vision of a global society and eradicate hunger and poverty by 2030. But if development aid money influenced by banks and corporations goes more to agricultural businesses and big farms, then it seems unlikely that this crucial goal will be reached.